A comparison of the reports from mind control victims and UFO abductees reveals some startling similarities. Both are heavy with psychosexual content. Both report unknown reasons why they are singled out to be part of an experiment. Many claim to be victims of both mind control and UFO abduction. So what I'm going to talk about today is not a complete examination of all that's known about anything to do with mind control, but rather it's going to be kind of a conglomeration of facts, reports, theories, conjecture, conjectures, and possibilities. The question remains, and it will remain after the talk, is mind control being used? If so, by whom and why? And most important to the victims, is there anything that can be done about it? And that we will, I will address, and we'll talk about some things that can be done about it. Since the beginning of recorded history, some humans have claimed to be the victims of mind control. The topic can be found in the book of Genesis in the Bible. And throughout the writings of many chroniclers since, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake for claiming she heard voices in her head. How often has we, have we heard murderers say, the devil made me do it, or God told me to kill so-and-so. The interesting thing is not are there voices in people's heads, but why and where do they come from? We're going to look at the background that relates to mind control, some actual reports by targeted individuals. At the end of the talk, I will play uh, excerpts from audio tapes of harassing signals that have been recorded by a computer programmer in his home. Uh, in a very interesting way, and also a direct voice to skull recording made by a businessman in San Francisco who rented the most sensitive microphone in the world called the Blue Mouse, and he recorded the voices in his head. And as you will hear, even though I've edited out most of the X-rated parts, that there is no way that these voices have anything to do with a TV broadcast, a radio broadcast, a telephone conversation, he, his brain is eavesdropping on something that was going on at some remote location because there was no sound in the room. Uh, he didn't just do this by himself. He had a witness, and the, the witness I trust implicitly. So you'll hear that at the end. So we'll go over some of the possibilities concerning the source of the claim that mind control is, is real and being inflicted upon certain individuals, which we call the targeted individuals. It is not, it's this, 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 or this. It can be combinations. There are some people that present as being under the influence of certain kinds of mind control, other people under different kinds of mind control. And unlike most of the talks you've heard today, even though I agree with almost everything I've heard, um, I'm not going to take the position that it's the government that's doing it. There are other possibilities. But it is also possible the government's doing because the government has this long history of experimentation on citizens without their permission and or um, control. Uh, I have over a thousand emails in my computer from, actually I have over 30,000 emails in my computer, but a thousand of these emails are from targeted individuals. Some of them are long and articulate, detailing specific effects they've experienced. Others are short and cryptic, cries for help and relief from the torture they're experiencing. Some seem to be the rantings of a human gone mad, either to start with or by having driven to mad, being driven to madness by a mind control harassing signals. Other TI seem to be demonically possessed, while others come across as UFO abductees or contactees. The um, concept of mind control as a technology is not new. In 1934, there was a report published in the United States entitled, A Method for Remote Control of Electrical Stimulation of the Nervous System by Chaffee and Light. And in the same year, the Soviets uh, produced a report by Vasilyev entitled, Experiments in Distant Influence. Now, I'll stop talking for a second, go over and turn a view graph on, and go over some items on the view graph. Okay. Um, 
is mind control possible? Absolutely. I'm only going to touch on just a few things. I gave more details during the psychotronics presentation. But there is a mountain, I mean a mountain of stuff. You've seen some of it here. I'm not going to repeat much of what you've heard here today. But there is a mountain of evidence, some of which is known by people here now that they've heard the presentations today, some of which you can read about in various publications, but some of which you've never heard before. Who would use it? We'll look at that. And why would anybody want to use it? A lot of people already have a mindset that, well, it must be the government and they're using them just a randomly selected guinea pig. That's one possibility. There are others. We'll talk about the targeted individual, some of the things that happens to them, and uh, possibilities, what's going on, and can there be anything done about what's going on? And uh, in some cases, yes, there can be. In other cases, not yet. Okay, who am I? Mary Ann introduced me with a few things concerning my background. Uh, I'd like to make some slight corrections uh, to some of the things she said and tell you a little bit more about who I am. Well, I'm a medical engineer with graduate degrees from both George Washington University, not Georgetown, and from uh, Brownell University in Elmhurst, England. Unfortunately, that university is now defunct, and the franchise was bought by some diploma mill in Florida so I stopped telling people, hey, my doctor of science degree is from Brownell University. Oh, that's the one you can buy. Um, it was an honorary degree. It was not uh, earned in the sense that I went to school there, and another reason for maybe not using it. However, it was granted based on my works and publications. Um, as she mentioned, I was a system engineer for the Polaris and Poseidon weapon system working for industry as a systems engineer on those projects. I was a project manager for the Naval's Metal Matrix Composites project and the Marine Corps' non-lethal non electromagnetics weapons project. I was a dolphin researcher that was uh, privately funded. And um, we were looking at basically interspecies communication. Can dolphins and humans communicate? The dolphins have very little difficulty communicating with us. We just don't know how to communicate with them. Uh, I, as far as I know, I, was the, I created the only data that still e exists, it's still unique, that proves that dolphins not only send out acoustic signals, simultaneously with the acoustic signals, they send out electric signals and magnetic signals. And they use phase information coming back from the acoustic and the magnetic fields. Uh, the electric fields, we think, are just because the acoustic signal, it goes along with them. But they, they use phase shift information to actually create images in their mind. And they can send these images to other dolphins using a combination of acoustic and magnetic fields. Uh, just when we were getting to the point where we were able to prove all this, uh, the funding dried up and uh, the project ended, even though we got tremendous amounts and interest of interesting data analyzed by the Navy, by the way. Same people that analyzed all the sonar data for the Navy's um, underwater sonar, fixed sonar systems. Um, I have patents, as Marianne mentioned, on techniques for separating the components of signals in both space and time. I've been on the board of directors for the, uh, of the United States Psychotronics Association for the past 17 years. And um, she mentioned that, I think. And the only classified project in the government I was ever read into, they call it being read into the project when, you, when it's classified, was the, the uh, government's remote viewing project. Everything I did on the non-lethal weapons project was unclassified. All the information I've been exposed to over the years about what might be called mind control technologies has all been unclassified. However, the remote viewing project does have mind control implications. I have checked to see what I could say about that, and I've been told I can talk about that all I want except for the targets. I said, well, I don't remember them anyway. <laughs> you know, these are submarine bases in the Soviet Union and, and you know, guided missile facilities in the Soviet Union, and I don't remember where all those were anyway. Minsk seems to be in my brain. <laughs> that's that's old, old stuff now. Um, the, 
pro the, the pro uh, patents I've mentioned, um, one of them is digital. I agreed with everything Ron Rhodes said, except for the statement that the brain is not a digital organ. The brain can, contains um, the facility to convert analog information into digital. So we gather analog information from our senses. Touch is an analog thing. Sight is an analog thing. Hearing is an analog thing. And the brain has to convert that analog information into digital because the brain is a digital organ. Think about it. It's got ones and zeros running around. Neurons are firing or they're not firing. That's a one or a zero. Brain's a digital organ. When I told my son what I had done with sound to separate acoustic signals in time and space, he said, gee, if it works for sound, it ought to work for light. And he came up with a technique for separating the components of light in space and time. And voila, you have three-dimensional television. It's a digital technique. The reason it works so well and it looks like 3D is because he's putting out, instead of 30 digital picture, uh, analog pictures on the TV screen, per second, he's putting 900 digital pictures on the screen per second, and your brain being a digital organ sucks that right in and creates 900 pictures a second instead of just 30 that you get with analog. Okay, some background. Entrenched in NASA's early rocket and space program were such notables as Werner von Braun, Kurt Debus, and over 100 scientists that were part of the Third Reich. Did you hear that? Debus was the V-2 rocket flight test director and later became the first director of the Kennedy Space Center. Von Braun was an officer in Hitler's SS and became director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. All the Germans who became the core of our space program were brought, brought to the United States under Operation Paperclip. Adolf Hitler once said something to the effect, if you tell a small lie, not many people will believe you, but almost everyone will believe a big lie. These are people that came from, from Hitler's Third Reich, and they were the head of our space program. What's that mean? Well, maybe nothing, but maybe a lot. The underlying philosophy of the Third Reich was that it was a magico occult based, that it was magico occult based, and it's interesting to note that Robert Monroe, who founded the Monroe Institute, stated that NASA's space capsule program was tied into mystical rituals, huh? Especially interesting is the connection between NASA officials and Freemasonry, especially the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. If you want to know more about that, you can look it up on the internet or get the paper I presented to the Psychotronics Conference. I list all the citations of where this information comes from. The fact is that there is a big connection between NASA officials, uh, the, the, the space program um, was started by Germans from the Third Reich. Over the years, reports have started to surface from people who claimed they were, there were men in black with little black boxes zapping them, and eventually the claims became more generic, and the reports seemed to focus on a feeling that the zapping was some kind of experiment on randomly selected individuals. Government was suspected because of the past histories of human experimentation without informed consent. As the number of TIs increased, so did the number of claims from skeptics that they must be psychotic. My first inkling that there was such a cadre of people as TIs came in 1998 when I ran across the posting on a website which included the sentence, quote, I would like to strap Eldon Bird to a gurney and drip sodium pentothal into his veins so he would come clean about mind control. I responded and opened a dialogue because it dawned on me that my project for the U.S. Marine Corps to develop a non-lethal magnetic weapon was being construed as involvement in a mind control program, which it wasn't, although... I later discovered that after the shutdown of the project, the technology did go dark. And I didn't go dark with it. So I may have been an unwitting accomplice in the development of the technology. We don't have to subscribe to conspiracy theories to see a mind control, um, to see mind control going on under our very noses right now, and rather overtly. In the last 12 years, almost all of the school children who have killed their fellow classmates and almost all the adults who have massacred others in the workplace and at home have been on one of the four members of a class of drugs that includes Prozac, 
Zoloft and Ritalin. If electromagnetic or other signals can induce similar effects, then the future of such events may lie in energy technologies rather than the chemical. But what about the technologies? Mr. Rust is absolutely correct when he said that emotions can control DNA. This is a fact. It's been demonstrated, replicated. And the, however, I hate to tell him <laughs> that the technology does exist to influence emotions, which can then influence the DNA. And unfortunately, the technology also exists to control scalars and use them to influence biological functions at the quantum level. That's the new technology you may not have heard of yet. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In the 1950s, the Soviets published an open literature report entitled Biological Radio Communication, document that thick, translated by the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force. It may have formed the basis for the Russian woodpecker because in this report, published in 1950, Vasilyev uh, said that at one to four channels of input to the human brain, thoughts could be injected, but the subject knew that they were coming from the outside, that they were external to the mind. Between five and, 12 and 11 channels, the thoughts were inside their head, but they knew they were not their own. And at 12 channels, the thoughts seemed to be their own. Maybe even an explanation for false memory syndrome. Interesting that the woodpecker, the Soviet woodpecker, worked up to 12 channels before going off the air. 10 years after the signal was discovered, I asked the CIA engineer assigned to it if they ever figured out what it was really for. And he replied, quote, it was either over the horizon radar or a psychoactive signal. It wasn't over the horizon radar because at the same time they had the woodpecker going, they also had satellite technologies to look over the horizon. They didn't need an over the horizon radar. That only leaves one possibility in my mind. Psychoactive signals have been observed and photographed on television sets inside people's homes in the United States. Interesting that when that photograph was sent to two places. It was sent to Dick Cheney's office under the previous Bush administration, and it was also sent to an aerospace corporation here in California. And the response from Cheney's office was, forget about this. It doesn't mean anything. From the aerospace company, it was, where'd you get this psychoactive signal? <laughs> How did they know? Uh, Jose Delgado has been mentioned here a few times, and he's kind of been painted in a way as a bad guy. I, Jose was a very good friend of mine. We haven't had any communication now for several years, but let me tell you three things about Jose Delgado. He moved from the United States to Spain, his home country, because he couldn't get anybody in the U.S. government to take him seriously. The, the CIA had to go and contact him in Spain and ask him questions if they wanted to know something because of a collection request. You know, the interesting thing about collection requests is that they are made by somebody in the government and there is a severance of who made the request. You know, there's a severance of, of that information to the collector. So the collector goes out with a set of questions. He hasn't the foggiest notion who asked these questions or why. It's just his job to ask the questions and bring back information. So Jose never knew who in the government wanted to know things. But one of the interesting things is that um, <clears throat> he was spending most of his time outside of Spain in the Soviet Union. And I asked him, I said, Jose, I said, why are you giving your technology to the Russians rather than the United States. You know, aren't we the good guys? He says, I don't know who the good guys are. He says, but I do know this. They pay attention to me. They listen to me. They roll out the red carpet. They're interested in what I'm doing. And, you know, I just get some flunky come over and ask me questions once in a while from the U.S. government. So he says, yeah, I talk to them because why not? They listen. Uh, he invited me to give a presentation at a conference he was hosting, not hosting, that he was the uh, chairman of in Montreal. This was we're talking about early 1980s. At this conference was everybody I had ever met that I knew was doing research and anything that might be construed as mind control that was doing it in an unclassified venue. 
included Andy Bassett, the bone healing guy. It included uh, uh, Demadian. It included uh, Polk. It included people. One guy even who had a, a lab. The only person in the whole Navy that I knew of was doing mind control research in a way, uh, even though I didn't get, consider mine to be that at the time. This guy was. And when the government shut his project down, the Navy shut his project down, the same day they shut mine down, he killed himself. And I thought, man, you know, there's a million interesting things to do in life. You know, I, I am not my projects. I, <laughs> I do not get married to the work I do. But he was. His, his life's work was his life. And when they shut down his life's work, he ended his life. Well, now I'm wondering if, <laughs> if he really did. I don't know anymore, I guess. Um, at this conference, I was sitting right between Andy Bassett and Jose Delgado, and across the table from me was Ross Aidey. And I asked all three of them, how long have you been a member of this society that's sponsoring this conference? And they all said, we've never heard of it. A month after the conference, I got a, there was a collection request that came out from who knows who in the government, and somebody from the intelligence community, just a young guy, had a set of questions. I said, who, who asked these questions? He says, I don't know. They don't, they don't tell me who asked them or why. I've just been sent to ask you these questions about that conference. And one of the things I told him was that the, uh, the sort of the top-level Russian that was there to give a presentation on mind control experiments in the Soviet Union using human beings in mental hospitals. And I asked her, and I described her as a heavy-set, humorless Russian PhD. And her response to my question, how do you get permission in the Soviet Union to do human experimentation in this area? And her response is, if you not have same problem in Soviet Union you have in the US of A. Okay. When the report came out about this, um, or there was a report that came out uh, a couple months later, and I had alerted the intelligence guy out at my laboratory, if anything comes through your office having to do with, with Soviet ELF or mind control or anything, let me know. And he says, hey, we just got a report in, it's classified confidential, you might want to see it. The report was the interview with me. And and the reason, reason I know that for a fact is, you know, um, Dr. So-and-so from the Soviet Union was described as a heavy-set, humorless <laughs> person. And so I knew it was the, the same, same interview. Of course, it was obvious when I read the content. So somebody in the government, and the reason I was interviewed was because I was the only, um, well, I was, I, was, I was the only person with a, Clear, a security clearance that was at that conference. No one there knew, had a clue who this guy was that put it together or this so-called society that was sponsoring it. Uh, I later found out that he was from East Germany and it was a fishing expedition just to see you know, who was doing what. So there was kind of a one-upsmanship. Uh, the government was, ob our government was oblivious and the East Bloc, Eastern Bloc, got the goodies. Today we know there are technologies that can induce sound into the brain at a distance, that can monitor and alter brain waves at a distance, that can alter behavior at a distance, that can induce images into the brain at a distance, that can target individual organs at a distance and disrupt calcium ions binding onto cell, individual cell surfaces at a distance, creating pain and other effects anywhere in the body and technologies that have moved beyond the realm of electromagnetics into the realm of hyperspace and scalars and into the quantum realm. We have demonstrated the ability of electric and magnetic fields to alter DNA and control bioelectric and biochemical processes in living systems. In other words, the technology to effect mind control exists without question. The question of whether it's being used is the cogent one. Reports from the open literature. One from NASA <clears throat> that says, the phenomena occurs at average power densities as low as microwatts per square centimeter with carrier frequencies between 0.4 to 3 gigahertz. 
By proper choice of pulse characteristics, intelligible speech can be created inside the brain. Do you know what operates also between 0.4 and 3 gigahertz? Your portable phone. Not your cell phone, your portable phone. Smack dab between those two exact frequencies. The 3 gigahertz one hasn't come out yet, but it's on the, it's, it's been developed. But 0.4 to 3 gigahertz is exactly where your portable phone works. That'll become important in a little while. <clears throat> How about this title? Gordon and Breach Publishing Company, abstract of a publication entitled, Experimental Production, quote, or parentheses, False Memories, by right hemispheric stimulation from complex weak magnetic fields, not images, memories. Author, Dr. Michael Persinger, April 24th, ninth, year 2000. You can find patents galore. There have been some mentioned here today at uh, www.truefacts.org slash menu slash patents dot html and of course the entire U.S. patent database at www.patents.uspto.gov. I'm only going to just mention a couple patents. The patents, uh, when you look at them, revealed an old set of technologies for the most part. As early as 1974 to 1976, that described techniques and devices reduced to practice for remotely inducing altered states of consciousness, consciousness, putting voices in a person's head, monitoring their brain waves, and altering their brain waves. It's been possible to send information directly into a person's brain via radio waves since before 1989. In 1985, an ears, eyes, and throat doctor in San Francisco told me directly that 10 years before that, he had put audio into a person's head via radio waves, and then in 1985, he could do it in, to such, in such a way that the person thought the information was an original thought in their mind. It required implanting a radio receiver directly on the oral nerve of the person. I said, you're telling me that there may be CIA operatives out there they are in direct communication with headquarters via radio waves and that they're being told what to do and communicating back and forth uh, directly with these implants. He says, no, I didn't say that. I said, well, you just told me that tech you developed the technology to do that. He says, oh, I don't have any, I'm, I'm not working for the CIA. I never were, never was. I said, that's odd. My note here says that contact this doctor in San Francisco that he developed this technology for us and it came from the CIA analyst. No, I've never done anything with the CIA. Patent number 523562 is the Monroe patent on his hemisync system. What's not generally known is that the patent includes altering another person's brain waves by imposing someone else's brain waves on them. Wow. A later improvement to Monroe's technique yielded patent number 5356358. In this patent, Monroe discusses how to put subliminal signals in background noise to alter brain states. Multiple sources are used, and even a hypnagogic or sleep state was shown, shown to be inducible via audio inputs. Nanotechnology was mentioned. It was just in the news last week that the same Japanese scientist who constructed a fully functional coil spring that fits inside a living cell has now made this little teeny plastic bull with horns and nostrils that conducts electricity that fits inside a living cell. If we can do that, what else can we do? It was just announced two weeks, three weeks ago that they have perfected a room temperature Josephson junction an artificially constructed device that only lets one electron through it at a time. Don't have to use, squids don't have to be made now with being dunked in liquid helium. You can do it at room temperature. When that was announced, a theoretical physicist friend of mine made a quick calculation. He says, my gosh, now we can make a brain the size of a brain. Same number of neuronal con connections acts just like a human brain. Of course, it'll make mistakes. In 1980 and 1981, I was tasked by the U.S. Marine Corps to develop a non-lethal weapon, 
using electromagnetic means. They were going to give this project to General Electric, but when I heard about it, I said, why do you want to do that? And, you know, I can do that. And they said, why can you do that? And I said, I'm the only medical engineer the Navy's got. And, you know, I've been looking into this kind of stuff. I, I think that's doable. And you don't have to give it outside. We can do it in-house. Well, I chose to concentrate on ELF nonlinear magnetics for several reasons. That was the easiest thing to do, uh, for one thing. When the project was terminated by the sponsor, it had been demonstrated that such signals could alter the behavior of rats, cause histamine to dump into brain tissue, and we could entrain human brain waves at a distance. I'm of such a conviction that I would not allow that part of the program project to be demonstrated to be used on anybody else but myself. I was the guinea pig for the brainwave entrainment part of that. You don't feel anything, just that for a while your brainwaves are different. So it worked. Oh, it worked. And immediately after I showed that we could do these things, they stopped the project and made it go dark, apparently. Under contract to me was Drs. Elizabeth Rauscher, Dr. Ross Aidy, Dr. Evan Harris Walker, and Michael Persinger. And uh, in addition to what I just said, at the theoretical level, we, you know, we showed that uh, in imaginary time and space, in hyperspace, electromagnetics results in solitons, and that only quantum events can occur in small neurons in your brain. And that phase conjugate fields, which create scalars, can cause profound effects in living systems. At the time, I thought that the shutdown of the project was just stupid on the part of the government, but it, I en enlisted the help of Senator Claiborne Pell, who, as a senator, could go and dig into classified projects and find out that, indeed, well, first he told me there was nothing there, and then a year later he said, he called me into his Senate office building, he said, can't give you the details, but um, your project went dark. So I have pretty good authority that it really did go dark. One central part of the project was the evaluation by Ross Aidy of the Light of Four. The CIA had, had obtained the vi device through Canada along with a photo showing a whole room full of people asleep in an audience with the Light of Four machine sitting on the podium. It was touted and patented in the US as a medical device that emitted extremely low frequency magnetic fields, acoustic signals in the form of clicks, heat, and electric fields. It was constructed in the 1950s. While it was in Dr. Aidy's lab at the VA hospital in Riverside, putting cats and rabbits into stupors, a tradesman passed by the lab confronted Ross, asked him where he got that brainwashing machine. Ross explained it was a medical device from the USSR. The tradesman said that he and his buddies had been brainwashed by an identical device during the Korean War in a POW camp. While they were under the influence of the device, questions and answers were read to them. When the Red Cross arrived to check on them, they asked questions, and the prisoners blurted out answers to the questions and wondered where the answers came from. If a technology was developed in the 1950s that worked to put people asleep at a distance and had a hypnagogic effect on them, it is reasonable to assume that it was refined and the device is made smaller. Psychodiagnosis and psychocorrection. I, I found it interesting that all the only project I was ever involved in that had to do with anything classified was remote viewing. And yet, once I got in, started listening to the people in the the TI area, I started noticing that I was also peripherally associated with a whole bunch of other stuff that I never put together as pieces of a puzzle before. Ten years ago or so, I was asked to be the chief engineer for a project that was co-sponsored by the Human Potential Foundation in Northern Virginia and uh, Chris and Janet Morris. Chris and Janet Morris brought two Soviet scientists to Washington, D.C., and then to the medical school at the University of Kansas to demonstrate a technique they called psychodiagnosis and psychocorrection. Although it involved the use of electrodes attached to the scalp, scalp, technologies have been developed to allow remote monitoring and intervention to occur. Basically, Dr. Igor Smirnov and his engineer had developed a very sophisticated computer program. It took a 486 computer several hours to analyze the data they collected in 20 minutes to look at brainwave responses to emotionally charged words. The computer generated a three-dimensional plot that related several variables, resulting in a diagnosis of what was the person's root cause of a problem. For example, if men, a man treated women badly, the cause might be hatred of his mother. 
the subject's brainwave response to words such as mother, love, hate, women, and so forth would be very telling. He was attached to a 32-channel EEG machine, and uh, as they watched a TV a display of what appeared to be random serial words flashing on the screen. Around the screen was a circle of LED lights flashing at an ELF rate. When I asked what they were for, the answer was, quote, to focus the attention to the screen. Sure, it was just like when I asked Dr. Smirnov, who claimed not to speak English, till I asked him a point-blank question in English, what the three orthogonal canisters were above the subject's head in a photo he passed around at the medical school at Kansas. He said, smiling, you come to Russia, we show you. Once diagnosed, an affirmation was constructed to change behavior. The affirmations were not direct. For example, if it was determined that a problem was driving a person's behavior had to do with their hating their mother, the affirmation would be in the form of, it's OK to hate your mother, not, don't hate your mother. This would reduce the stress associated with hating one's mother. The affirmation was converted into a sound file in the computer, turned upside down, 180 degrees phase shift in amplitude, and reversed. It was then embedded in white noise and played to the subject as a subliminal. The 180 degree phase shift and reversal made the affirmation more easily assimilated by the subconscious. Change occurs at the subconscious level before it occurs at the conscious level. Of equal interest was a computer game that was demonstrated where the subject would try to guess a random number the computer would select. A score was kept during 100 trials. Guessing would indicate a 1 in 10 chance of guessing the right number. However, some volunteers scored 30 out of 100. Then the computer would look at the guess compared with the next machine selection. And in some subjects, they scored much higher when their guesses were compared with the second number the computer randomly chose, proving the existence of precognition. The Russians said the KBG was interested in their technology, but they hadn't given it to them. At the University of Kansas, the staff was interested if the technique had been used to treat alcoholics. The response was, alcoholism is not a disease. People drink for many reasons. When we discover the underlying cause of drinking, we can make excessive drinkers stop. Maze. Anybody read the book Maze by Larry Collins? Came out about 1984. The book Maze by Larry Collins. You know who Larry Collins is, the author? Everybody, anybody ever read O oh, Jerusalem? Is Paris Burning? They made movies of these. You know, this is the Larry Collins. Um, he contacted me and hired me to be the technical consultant for his book. I was still working for the government, so I asked him to please don't mention my name in the book, and he complied. And um, we collaborated on uh, the approach to technology, which uh, the book wove several complex plots together. One of the more interesting to you here is where the head of the KGB had a brain tumor, a lot of EEG records were obtained and analyzed to determine his brainwave patterns for various states of mind like rage, laughing, uh, focusing attention, and so forth. The idea was to influence the President of the United States by impressing brainwaves into his head during an important decision to sway the decision in the KGB's favor. We settle on the technique of creating a scalar signal by phase conjugating two magnetic fields at right angles to each other. And you heard uh, Brother Rhodes talk about that. One generator was placed in a van about a half a mile from the White House and the other in an apartment about half a mile away. The field strengths necessary to create the desired effects were well within the realm of what had already been demonstrated. But the critics panned the novel, saying it was way too far out. I later suggested to Larry that a more practical way of doing the same thing would be to use the telephone. That was when telephones still had a magnetic pickup in the earpiece, and we could modulate that magnetic field and cause an effect. That book was published you know, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, John Mack, at the Prophets Conference in New York in June of 2001 this year, stated that many UFO abductees, contactees, claimed to also be victims of mind control. Caroline. McLeod constructed a study which showed that character structure and psychopathology have little to do with telling us about the nature and meaning of an alien encounter. And I would submit the same thing holds true for TIs. A TI from Michigan, whose tape you'll hear excerpts from later, was psychologically evaluated after he went to the police and said, somebody is harassing me electronically, and he played tapes for him, and they said, well, son, you need to go get psychologically evaluated. You're nuts. Uh, he took a written psychological test, 
passed it fine. No pathology was noted. The psychologist who interviewed him afterwards wrote a report and said, yeah. with the exception of this guy hearing voices in his head, he's uh, perfectly normal. Uh, actually, McLeod's study indicated that most UFO abductees were suffering from some sort of post-traumatic shock. Well, darn, if I'd been abducted by aliens, I'd be in shock too. And the, the, the situation arises, which is valid for TIs also, as to how poorly understood these people are and badly served by a psychology that's based on pathology and or psychodynamics. If TIs are to be helped, methods of understanding must be developed that can combine human experience with empirical study and relate them to communication at a subjective level. Also, the mental health field needs to transform from its position on pathology to an alternative that includes self-realization. At some point, the TI is going to say something to the effect, I don't know why I'm being a target, but regardless of what my friends and the culture says or thinks, these experiences are happening to me. They do not need external verification. When the TIs can reach this point, it helps them become grounded. They can feel that they know themselves well enough to say, what I know about myself tells me I'm having this experience and that's good enough. However, the current worldview is based on scientific materialism, that reality can only be determined by the scientific method, which is hypothesis, controlled experiment, measurement, replication. Unless something can be proven to exist by this method, it is dismissed out of hand or relegated to the purgatory of the subjective. Richard Souter was mentioned. He's written several books on secret installations and various things, including Kundalini experiences. He visited some underground government facilities that he discovered in the open literature. How these places became known in the first place is kind of unknown to me, but however, their location startled me. One was very close to where I used to live outside of Washington, D.C. One TI has described her experiences to me at one such installation in Virginia. It was an underground bunker that was supposed to house high-level government officials in the event of nuclear war. When she was about nine years old, she was, quote, drafted. Her father was a mafia chief um, and worked with the Pentagon, she said. She was drafted to participate in a study to determine how people might act if they thought a nuclear war had broken out. The participants were told that during the study, war had broken out. Ho hokey videos were shown depicting victims and devastation outside the, the bunker. The TI reports that havoc ensued. Men took babies and dashed their brains out against walls. Rape and violence were common. The same TI, now a respected academician with a PhD in social psychology, also relates incidents concerning a secret enclave of World War II expatriated German physicians and their families hidden deep in the jungles of Brazil along the Amazon River. When only about seven or eight, she was taken there on several occasions. She was the go-between, between, between Germans and an indigenous tribe of natives who practiced sympathetic magic. The details are too lengthy to include here. However, I independently verified the existence of this enclave. As a matter of fact, it just so happens that uh, the friends I'm staying with while well, here this weekend um, verified this. Uh, they've been there. They've talked to the Germans. They know about them. And they didn't know anything about this other person. Uh, that the Monroe Institute, tucked away in the forests and hills of Virginia, had a connection to the government is a loosely held secret. What has gone on there and what goes on there is not entirely public. But I do know this. I know that the CIA did experiments with Bob Monroe. I know that the current scientific director there came from the Army's remote viewing program at Fort Meade in Maryland. It's suspected that military psychic spies were trained there. It is known that active duty army personnel were there and even assisted the staff in certain duties. My experience with the intelligence community leads me to believe that a certain part of their childhood has never grown up. I got a secret. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> this is part of their personality. The, my CIA contact uh, left the agency 15 years ago. I just contacted him the day before yesterday. He left the CIA to become director of research for General Motors. He is now head of all General Motors operations in the Far East. And he told me in an email the day before yesterday, he says, 
And I said, there's no such thing as mind control. The CIA was never involved in mind control. No government agency's ever been involved in mind control because everyone's too stupid in the CIA and the government to get involved in a mind control program. We were interested in whether or not the technology existed. I, I assume he's talking about electronic mind control because obviously, you know, anybody who's been listening in the last few years at all knows that the CIA was involved in, in mind control experiments with drugs. He was a public law appointee, you know, higher than any GS level rate, higher than a GS-18. And he was head of life sciences division for the CIA. And he was totally oblivious when I used to visit there. The first time I ever went there, he had this plaque on the side of his office door that said LSD. And I said, LSD? That stands for life science division. I said, it also stands for LSD. <laughs> I mean, you're the same guys that were doing the... He said, no, we didn't do that. And he just kind of didn't dawn on him that LSD could stand for LSD, too. You think the government and the CIA has never been involved in mind control experiments? Here's a good one. I don't know if you've heard this or not. I was just kind of shocked and dismayed when I heard it. The article that ran in the Los Angeles Times on the 6th of July, 1999, by Alexander Cockburn, pointed out very clearly and without rebuttal that Ted Kaczynski, you know who Ted Kaczynski is? The Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski was part of a CIA mind control experiment at Harvard in the late 50s. That's a fact. That can be verified very easily. Of course, you've heard about Project Moonstruck, which preceded MKUltra. There was Project Orion in 1958 in the, U in the Air Force, where they used ELF modulation of radar and microwaves. MK Delta uh, superseded MK Ultra in 1960. It was long range ELF modulation of VHF, HF, and UHF signals to put on television, radio, power lines, and maybe other radiating sources. There was a Project Trident, which I had nothing to do with. My Trident had to do with the Trident submarine. You know, <laughs> you know, there was a lot of hype about the Polaris weapon system. We, we had this great undersea, invulnerable doomsday machine that could wipe out the entire world six times you know, if, the, if the Soviets got uppity. You heard a little bit about Poseidon when it was going to um, uh, replace Polaris, and, and now we had MIRVs. We had multiple independent vehicle uh, reentry vehicles that could go and hit multiple cities, not just one big, huge explosion to put a super hole in the ground with a 10 megaton device. And but how much have you heard about Trident? The Trident submarine is bigger than a football field. It's, it's 300 yards long. It's almost 1,000 feet long. It's this huge, monstrous sub, one submarine. One Trident submarine can kill everybody on the Earth 10 times. And we got a whole fleet of them sitting out under the ocean no one talks much about it. You know, it's the ultimate doomsday machine. But this project Trident, which was sponsored in 1989 by NASA and the Office of Naval Research, was for riot control, crowd control. Everybody's heard about HARP, but did you know that the frequency that they use to ping the ionosphere is the same frequency that DNA, human DNA, is resonant with. That does not sound like a good idea to me. Project Clean Sweep, CIA, NSA, and ONR, 1997-1998. What's it for? It's for monitoring and recording of media events from a helicopter. Mm -hmm rebroadcasting those events to influence large groups of people and affect mass behavior control. Media events? Rebroadcasting? Smacks of mind control to me. It's also known that uh, Army Colonel John Alexander was instrumental in getting neuro-linguistic programming tried in the military as a training technique. NLP masters claim they can kill people with it at a distance. I used to have lunch with John Alexander. When he became head of uh, research for the Army in terms of not making a lot of the decisions on what got funded, but for dispersing the fund, he had $10 billion worth of funding that he could uh, fund projects with, not of his choosing, but to make sure that the right things got funded, but he had an input. 
Uh, he apparently ruined his career by conducting metal bending parties. <laughs> Nobody knows what metal bending parties are? Has it been that long? Jack yeah. Jack Houck, right from uh, Los Angeles here, developed the, the technique that allows anybody to interact mind their mind with a piece of flatware and make it so soft you can tie it in knots. Um, on February 6, 1998, I won't reveal the source of this, although the person who said this is here and will know who it is. On February 6, 1998, testimony was presented to Clinton, Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Commission. In one of these presentations, it was established that experiments with microwaves in pregnant women had been conducted by the NIH and FDA. The NIH and FDA both stated they kept no records of the experiments. Anybody who's ever worked for the government knows this is either a lie or the documents have been destroyed. It was also established that universities are involved in black ops. For example, in 1998, UCLA's Human Subject Protection Committee issued, and by the way, I guess this would be of interest, I wrote the Navy's human experimentation protocols. I wrote them because I was going to involve myself in an experiment, and I wanted to make sure that I wrote the protocols. You had informed consent That's right. <laughs> I made very sure that it's perfectly legal for a person to experiment on themselves. No law against that. It is against the law to kill yourself during the experiment, however, <laughs> would you believe. <laughs> no one's ever been prosecuted for that. but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, when I went back the following year and I said, I want to modify the protocols, they said, no, we can't do that. I said, why not? And they said, well, we already have a set of protocols. I said, yeah, I know, I wrote them. And they said, well, they've been blessed by the powers that be, and nobody, not even you who wrote them, are allowed to change them. Anyway, the, the UCLA's Human Subject Protection Committee issued an edict requiring all human subjects be informed of the risks involved in any experiment including black projects. UCLA was or and or is affiliated with Los Alamos and the Lawrence Livermore Labs. A literature search indicates that biomedical telemetry went dark in about 1985. Prior to this, it was a hot area of interest. I published a paper on the telemetry of brain waves in a hospital environment in 1972 as, and was in demand as a speaker on the subject in about 1982 and suddenly as if a switch was thrown in 1982, from then to this very day, biomedical telemetry, telemetry uh, is not a subject. All interest in the field just seemed to abruptly stop about 1982. Okay, I have some tidbits of information to share before we hear the tape. Can I do a correction? A correction. Uh, there was a paper in the bio telemetry published in 1986 out of Marquette University in Wisconsin, and I cited in this paper some of the papers I gave you. Okay, so that's, that's, anyway. In 1982, the International Biotelemetry, the Biotelemetry, or Biomedical Telemetry Conference was a book of papers this thick in 1982, and I don't think they ever had a conference again. Um, briefly, another question. Yes. Yes. They're, they're all over the place. They started in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, Soviets invented the phased array radar, but we're not going to get into that. Just a few little miscellaneous tidbits. Secretary of Energy O'Leary has stated, and I think it's been mentioned here earlier, 500,000 Americans have been experimented on without their consent. I, I think he's just refrets all he would be able to comment. Just, just the radiation experiments. Yeah, and he's admitted that some of these 500,000 people have committed suicide because of those experiments. Michael Persinger, who was recommended to me, and I put him under contract in my project, he was recommended to me by the CIA as somebody, hey, you might want to talk to Michael Persinger, you know, he's, he's really got onto something. He said, quote, entire populations can be influenced over TV and radio and telephones and the internet, inducing fear in people. And then they can be told 
that that fear they're feeling is coming from such and such a source, whether it is or not. And they'll gl glom right onto that. His contention is it's the right amygdala in the brain is the interface between external fields that can influence behavior to the point where people can have hallucinations. He says, I can make people hysterically blind. He says, I've got a, a, a signal shape. He says, I keep the frequency the same, I keep the intensity the same, I just change the shape of it a little bit. And people say, why'd you turn off the lights? You can make a person blind, and they're not really blind. You can make it so they can't hear with just these weak, weak magnetic fields. Uh, there, I won't go into it too much, except in this one tape you'll hear. There's um, some connection between mind control and child molestation. We're not quite sure what that's about yet, but there seems to be a thread there. Um, Alan Fry, private researcher, had a company in Philadelphia called Random Line, of all things. I used to go to, I used to interact with the, the alphabet soup people, the CIA, the DIA, the MIA, and one that wasn't an IA, it was NAV Stick, the Naval Scientific Intelligence, uh, Scientific Intelligence, Scientific, Scientific Technical and Intelligence Command. And I, I walked in there once, and I even did a, did a study for them. Once when I was uh, in the Naval Reserves, I could uh, kind of go on, on the job training anywhere I wanted. So I signed up for a two week stint one summer to go to the NAV Stick and do a study for them on how effective it would be for the Soviets to spray biological agents from a submarine off our coastal areas. Um, you know, I walk, I walk in there, and here'd be Alan Fry sitting at the in Naval Intelligence Command. And I'd say, What are you doing here? Oh, got some friends here. You know. But of course, the Navy was interested in what he was doing. He was showing that you could use microwaves to put sound in people's heads. Um, I had occasion two years ago to be in San Francisco, and I had dinner with Vladimir Poponin. Now, I didn't know who Vladimir Poponin was. Anybody here heard of Vladimir Poponin? I said, uh, uh, you, did you immigrate or are you just here on a visa? No, oh, I immigrated years ago, immigrated. I said, well, what did you do when you were in the Soviet Union. He says, I was working with ELF. And I said, oh, you know, what were you doing with ELF? Mind control. Just deadpan face. It's like, <laughs> wow. Everybody ever hear of the people zapper? This was on the news the other night. They didn't tell who had developed this, but the government claims they have a thing called a people zapper. And what they've figured out how to do is transmit at a distance infrared radiation, heat. They can cook a person, not with microwaves, with infrared, with heat at a distance. There are weapons to specifically target the heart. Interesting that it's been reported uh, in several places, and, and I've talked to Uri Geller myself, and he verifies this that he was contacted by a government agency, an intelligence group. He doesn't know which one it was. They took him into a room and they said, There's a, look through this glass, there's a pig in the next room and we would like you to stop that pig's heart. He says, why do you want me to stop a pig's heart? He said, because a pig's heart's the same size of a human heart. He said, you think I'm gonna help you do that? You're crazy. He wouldn't do it. Um, NASA, they have reported enough that we know they have voice to skull technology. And they've given some of this to law enforcement agencies. Ron McRae, who wrote Mind War, shortly after the book came out, he was put in prison for child molestation. The Bulgarians and the Japanese have written books on mind control. Martin Eben wrote a very poor book called Psychic Warfare. Alan Dulles, director of the CIA in, in April of 1953, said, quote, we're in a battle for the control of men's minds. Well, why was the director of the CIA saying that? In 1972, Helms left the CIA. Don't you dare go on the internet and try to look up anything about Helms. Because if you do, there will be a cookie put in your cookie list that says www.cia.gov. That's a fact. You want to try it, it's fun. <laughs> you will get a cookie from the CIA if you want to know anything about Jesse Helms. Richard Helms, not Jesse Helms. <laughs> yeah, Jesse Helms is a different animal. Sorry, Jess. Yeah. 
Um, I could go on and on and on about uh, the woodpecker and stuff and Delgado, but uh, time is, is, way, is slipping by here. I just came back in June from a conference called Electromed 2000 and one. There was an Electromed 1999, there will be Electromed 2003 in San Antonio, this was in Portsmouth, Virginia. These are academicians, PhD engineers, every one of them. Matter of factly talking about all these neat things they're doing in their lab. They're not talking to anybody else about it, as far as I know, except the Air Force was there. That was kind of interesting. I said, are you from the School of Aerospace Medicine? It's an electromedicine conference. Makes sense if you're from the School of Aerospace Medicine. No, no, not from the School of Aerospace Medicine. What part of the Air Force are you from? Well, we're interested in this technology. So they're getting it. It has been demonstrated over and over again. There's no question about this. I mean, they've got, they even have the theory nailed down. They've proven the theory. They have electron microscope photographs of all this. They can now, with a high frequency electric pulse, no more magnetic, that's gross stuff. At, I developed a theory about how you can influence the inside of a cell with a long, slow frequency, like 10 hertz or less, magnetic field. And it has to do with developing a soliton wave on the surface of the cell. And when that soliton wave, which is caused by this slowly changing external magnetic field, when that soliton wave bumps into a receptor sticking up out of the cell, it might be, if it's a pancreas cell, it might be looking for sugar. And if it bumps into that, it'll shock the receptor. And it'll put the same signal down inside the cell that says make, make insulin as if there's sugar really there. And so we had a mechanism for influencing the, the uh, function of even a, a, a cell. But that's pretty gross. This is what they can do now. They can take a, a high frequency pulse and they can zap a cell and it caused the cell to open up a pore. It doesn't hurt the cell at all, it just opens up a hole in the cell. And if there are chemicals, depending on the frequency of this pulse, if there are chemicals in the external environment, the cell will suck them in. Think of 5,000 times more chemical inside a cell than you can just by taking a pill or having an injection. Electroporation. Electroporation. The first set of papers were about electroporation and how they can zap the cell with two pulses and keep the pore open longer and make the, even increase this. And then there was a whole bunch of papers after that said, ah, oh, that's old technology. We have nanopulses now, picopulses now, that we can, that the cell membrane is totally transparent to. We don't have to open up pores in the cell anymore. We can get in there and make the DNA replicate anything we want, any chemical that's capable of replicating. We can trigger that internally without opening up. You don't have to put a chemical in the cell anymore. And we can influence the actual migration of electrons on each one of the strands of the double helix of the DNA. And we can make the DNA do anything we want. We can go in there and alter the genes in the DNA to make them do anything we want. We can even let the DNA release the hydrogen bonding that holds the strands together, make them unwind, make them wind, make them form toroids. We can, in effect, do what you thought they couldn't do, Mr. Rust. Unfortunately, they can control things that go on inside cells at the quantum level. They can control the scalars. That is the scary news. Like blue eyes, uh, green or black, uh, Not, well, they can influence the DNA to do that. Um, whether, I think they can, but I think that after they did that, there is still enough information in the programming that's uh, coincident with other things going on, that it will revert back and it would be a temporary change. I, I saw 30 years ago, I saw a presentation by two young researchers at the University of Utah and they took duck blood from a domestic white duck and duck blood from a Japanese black duck and they made serum and they started cross injecting the serum from the white duck's blood into the black duck and vice versa. And over a period of 30 days, they transformed a domestic white duck into a Japanese black duck. White ducks walk upright, the Japanese ducks walk horizontal. They actually changed the bone structure over a period of time. But when they stopped giving the injections, the ducks reverted back to their previous normal self. The tapes.
first tape you're going to hear, these are excerpts. I'll, I'll turn it on, and then you'll hear something, and I'll turn it off. The first thing you're going to hear is a recording made by a computer programmer in Michigan off of channel 81 from his old black and white television set. So what? Well, if you have an old television set, it has a mechanical dial for the UHF channels. They go from 14 up to 89 or 86, rather. And sometime in the, the past, and I don't know exactly when, the FCC took away the upper channels, UHF TV channels, from the TV industry and gave them to the portable cell phone, cell phone people, or the portable telephone people. So, path, and if you've got a new television set with the coaxial cable, it doesn't go past 69. All the television stations from 70 through 83 or 84 were given to the portable phone people. So the first thing you're going to hear is a recording made off of channel 81 at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on February the 20th of this year. The second one will be at 3.15 on the same date. And you'll see that there's a difference. If you have an old television set, go home and turn it on to anything above channel 69 and you will hear <laughs> that constant static. It's nothing but white noise. There's nothing there. This shouldn't be. later and the voices are a little more clear in this. claims he can understand what they're saying. He hears things like, die. We're raping your mind. Why don't you just give up and die? You don't have any control. You're going to be among the victims. We're messing with your brain. I'm using, even though there's no children in the audience, I'm, I'm not using the exact words. It, he says he hears, give up and move out. Uh, I don't hear that. And I told him, I said, I don't hear anything. I hear you know, these voices kind of, but I don't hear anything. He says, it's amazing. He says, everybody that listens to this says they can't hear. He says, I hear it very clearly. Oh. Now, <clears throat> now, there is a problem with this, these two. He lives in a populated area. Remember I said that the FCC gave those channels away to the portable phone industry. I can't, for all I know, he's picking up portable phone conversations. But to him, they're saying these things to him. They're not just talking about how, how you doing, what are you doing tonight. They're saying, why don't you die? You know, we're raping your mind. Anyway, I don't know. So I, I, I can't comment about whether or not this is real electronic harassment or whether it's portable phone conversations. But to him, it's harassment because I've asked him. I said, "Do you hear this kind of stuff anywhere else?" He says, "Sure." He says, "I turn on my blender; it comes out of the blender. I go out in my car and drive away. I hear it coming out of the radio. Same stuff." That's interesting. 
Now, the next segment was made off of his answering machine. maybe your answering machine isn't working. <laughs> he says, it works all the other times. He says, it's only when I hear these harassing signals that my answering machine sounds like that. Again, I said, well, you know, it sounds like the answering machine might be malfunctioning. So I was very disappointed at this point. I thought, well, I'm not even going to play this kind of stuff at, at you know, any of these uh, talks because it, it has, there's several explanations possible. And then he hit me with this. This is... Um, taken off his shortwave radio and when I heard this it was very unnerving to say the least. that. I'm going to have to skip until the end of this. It was almost finished. Okay. I'm, I'm calm down. Okay. Because the next thing is more important. Okay. This next is, these are the voices from the guy's head in San Francisco. No. That was another one of the... <laughs> the short wave. It's okay. It just surprised me. I'm okay. I'm well. So surprised that somebody had recorded it. He, he, called, he contacted me when he started the project. Okay. These are the voices from the guy's head. It's not going fast forward. It, fast forward doesn't work. So we'll have to go. We'll have to I'll turn it down. Okay, it's over. Okay, here are the voices from the guy's head. It's amazingly clear.
Well, you, you can hear Yao and, and E, and, and they're saying things. No, you can't come in here. Come on, Dale, for crying out loud. You're not going to get it. Ow, it hurts. It hurts. Leave off. Ow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No, 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 no. E. And I've edited the X-rated parts. There's a little segment right here at the end where it's amplified, and you can hear it a little bit better. And remember, there's no, no, there's nothing happening in the room. You, you're standing there, you don't hear anything. It's only when he puts the microphone on his skull you can hear this. And the reason it cannot be a TV station, a radio station, or a phone conversation is because it's molestation of children. Possibilities. It's not one thing or another. Some of these people that are TIs, and I've talked to one at great length, and we've come to the conclusion that in her case, she's possessed by demons. History is replete with people being possessed by demons. This is not as unusual as you would, might think. It, there are some people that present themselves as if they're under attack by some kind of electromagnetic energy. It can be the electric field, either of the two components of the magnetic field, the A field, the magnetic vector potential, which we know is biologically very active. These are vector fields. Subtle energy fields like scalars, which I mentioned, and, and the spin-offs of that which are subatomic at the quantum level. Alien technology, the, the fact that there's such similarities between a lot of the TI's reports and the UFO abductee reports means that there might be alien technology involved in, with some people. False memory syndrome. False memory syndrome is extremely powerful. You have a memory that's exactly like every memory you have, so it's part of your experience, even though you may not have gone through the memory. Uh, and false memory syndrome is very real. We also know that Michael Persinger has induced false memories into people using electromagnetic means. <clears throat> but false memory syndrome can also be induced by chemical alterations in the brain. Psychotronics. Psychotronics is the interaction of the mind with mat matter. It can be the interaction of a mind with another mind. The thing that's good news about some of these, including psychic attack, mental illness is also a possibility. Whether the person was driven mad by being harassed or they were mad to begin with and think they're being harassed, uh, who knows. But OK, what can be done? Demonic possession, prayer. Prayer is very effective. Works better with groups, absolutely. Prayer is your communication with God. Meditation is God's communication with you. Never end a prayer by hanging up. Listen. Um, spirit releasement, the Baldwins, published books on spirit, evil spirit releasement, and, and that can get rid of demonic possession. Um, Exorcist, priesthood, prayer and fasting. So there is some help for these people, but it's very difficult. They can't do it alone. How about the uh, EM energies? There are blocking devices. Saw one here a little earlier. Um, here I have two. One puts out the, no the natural frequency, resonant frequency of the Earth ionosphere cavity. We live in it all the time. We assume it's benign. It amplifies it locally. It will overwhelm any magnetic field coming in Unless you're in the middle of Los Angeles or New York City, then it probably doesn't work too well there. Um, these devices are available. Um, they're about 65 bucks. I can get them. Or you can just let me know and I can get them. For, in fact, this one, this particular one is, is saleable right now. I just have one of each. This one uh, is not in quite as nice and pretty a box, but you'll notice that this one's tunable. You can make it go anywhere from about 90 cycles a second on down to a half a cycle a second. So you're a different person every day. You've got different cells in your body. You respond to different electromagnetic signals. You have different moods. You can tune it every day to what feels right for you. 
A lot of people don't want to mess with something like that, so they want one that's just a, like a magic bullet. Well, there is no magic bullet. Yeah, it's different though. It puts an electrical signal right into your head. Yeah. This is a magnetic field. This, these two devices have been tested scientifically and measured with very extremely sensitive, very extremely sensitive magnetometer. It's only one order of magnitude less sensitive than a squid. And these devices both put out a field that's easily detectable out to 20 feet in front of you and behind you. And it's 10 feet high and, and um, it's two feet wide. So you're in a, an ellipse. You put it in your pocket, you're in an ellipse of a field that will interact with any incoming magnetic field and alter it. It'll change it. Now, but that's only one aspect. It only does magnetic fields. I've made a few that do scalar fields also, but I don't know how effective they are. All I know is that it puts out a scalar field too that's the same scalar field. In the scalar, it's the same as the magnetic field, but it's a scalar. Um, there's various models of that. Some involve Tesla type coils. Subtle energy, that's the bugaboo. That's why I was asked the question of Mr. Rhodes and I was glad to hear that they have something they claim will do scalar fields because that's, that's really tough. And that's the new technology. And we don't know how to even, as far as I know, except for what he may have, even detect this, these suckers unless you're in a university with an electron interferometer, which are very expensive. Uh, yeah, I've, I haven't talked to Bill Tiller about that, but I've read his book, and that might be okay. It, it's, it's part of an answer, maybe. It's not. Yeah, you can buy as many. They're selling, the government's selling surplus Geiger counters now. They're like 20 bucks. They were $1,000 when they were made. Alien technology. Maybe some people are under the influence of alien technology, but how to prove that? Um, psychotronics. There is a false memory syndrome. Um, I don't know. How do you? You can, if you're under the influence of false memory syndrome, the only way you can even find out is reality check with somebody else. I don't have time to go into that, but that's the only way I know of. Psychotronics, there is hope. If it's a psychotronic attack, there is a way of sending it back. Also, there's a way of sending back electric high frequency microwaves. There's a way of detecting them. They're called radar detectors for your car to keep the police from, you know, you can get alert. And there are radar jammers you can buy that have corner reflectors that reflect the radar from the police's signal back at them after modifying the incoming signal. See, no, there's the only states that I know that they're illegal in is Connecticut and Washington, D.C. They used to be illegal in Michigan, but the, the law was changed. And radar detectors and radar jammers, so far as I know, are legal everywhere except Connecticut and Washington, D.C. The reason that the jammers are legal is because the police say they don't work. Well, they would say they don't work. Okay, okay. Uh, wrap up and then we'll do some questions. Maybe it's a laser jammer. But the, the radar detectors nowadays will also detect the laser signal, so you can tell if you're being lazed. Um, psychic attack, there are techniques for sending back that true, too. There are psychotronic devices that you can use to send back unwanted input psychotronically. They're available from, the, there'll be a list of people who supply these things. It's www.psychotronics.org. Um, mental illness. Some people may be mentally ill and, and think they're being zapped. However, a lot of people may have allergies to electromagnetic signals, just like they have allergies to food. There are a certain number of people, they've been measured. The people who have allergies to pollen, some of them are also allergic to electromagnetic fields and, and waves. So their allergies may pay, play a role. I didn't put that on the, the list.